palladium-catalyzed cross-coupling reactions fundamentally changed the way we develop drugs and design new medicines. These reactions gave chemists the ability to form new carbon-carbon and carbon heteratom bonds on aromatic rings by joining two molecules together, an aryl halide and a cross-coupling partner, which can take the form of many different types of reagent. The reaction rapidly expanded the number and types of molecules that medicinal chemists could make and quickly became a key reaction in their toolbox. By far the most commonly used couplings are the buckwood hartwig reaction for the formation of carbon heteratom bonds and the Suzuki reaction for forming carbon-carbon bonds. In fact, the Suzuki cross-coupling is the second most commonly used reaction in all of small molecule drug discovery. The reaction involves the coupling of an aryl halide with an organoboron compound to produce a new carbon-carbon bond. Although the Suzuki reaction is the most common carbon-carbon cross-coupling reaction, as well as the one most commonly taught in organic chemistry classes, there are many others. In this video, we will discuss a forgotten reaction that can address a key problem of the Suzuki reaction when it is applied to medicinal chemistry and drug discovery. In 1976, while working at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom, Colin Eborn reported the first example of a palladium-catalyzed cross-coupling reaction using an organotin cross-coupling partner. In this reaction, aryl halides were reacted with bis-tributyl tin and palladium tetrachris triphenylphosphine, which led to the dimeric product. This work was built upon by Megita in 1977, where he expanded the reaction to the coupling of acyl chlorides with alkyl tin reagents. John Kenneth Stilley then went on to publish two papers between 1978 and 1979 with improvements on this work by increasing the yield under milder conditions using a range of organotin species. This reaction offered benefits over the previously discovered Kumada coupling as organotin reagents are generally easy to prepare and are stable to moisture and air unlike the Grignard reagents used in the Cumada coupling. In 1986, Stilly published an influential review on the palladium-catalyzed reactions of organotin reagents with a range of electrophiles. Due to his work on the application and mechanism of this reaction, the palladium-catalyzed cross-coupling of organotin reagents would go on to bear his name, with the reaction becoming known as the Stilly coupling. Sadly, Stilly's research career and life would be cut short in 1989 when he was involved in the United Airlines 232 crash. Many have proposed that if it wasn't for his premature death, he would have gone on to share a piece of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which was given to Suzuki, Nagishi and Heck for their work on palladium-catalyzed cross-coupling reactions. While the Stilly reaction was the first cross-coupling capable of forming carbon aryl bonds with bench-stable reagents, it was quickly surpassed in 1979 when Suzuki reported the first cross-coupling using a boron-based coupling partner, reacting a vinyl boronate species with vinyl and aryl halides. This work was expanded in 1981 when it was shown that the simpler boronic acids could be used as coupling partners. The advantage of the Suzuki reaction is that the boronic acids used are generally non-toxic and very safe to use, compared to the organotin reagents used in the Stilly coupling. This is the main drawback of the Stilly reaction and is why it is not as commonly used. Both the organotin reagents and the side products generated in the Stilly coupling are toxic and bad for the environment. This toxicity does depend on what groups are attached to the tin atom with tributyl tin compounds being around 100 times less toxic than their trimethyl analogues. Due to this, the commercially available organotin reagents are tributyl tin derivatives. The Suzuki reaction went on to completely revolutionize the drug discovery process and has been used in the synthesis of hundreds of approved pharmaceuticals. Due to its advantages over the Stilly reaction, it has gone on to be basically the only reaction taught for forming bioaryl compounds in most university classes. However, what is not taught is a key problem with the Suzuki reaction, especially when applied to medicinal chemistry and drug design. In 2007, 
The drug discovery and pharmaceutical commentator Derek Lowe wrote a blog post on the reaction in science. He said that the Suzuki and steady coupling perform the same reaction, and due to the Suzuki reaction being much safer, why would anyone still use this reaction? He went on to say that he was not aware of any pharmaceutical processes that use it, which as we will see, is not the case. While it is true that given the option, the Suzuki reaction is going to be your first choice due to the reasons previously mentioned, this is not always possible. Most substituted phenylbronic acids can be bought and are able to be stored on the bench for years. The problem is with electron deficient heterocycles such as pyridine and pyrimidine as well as 5-membered heterocycles containing a pyridine like nitrogen, such as pyrazoles, thiazoles and oxazoles, as their bronic acids are simply not stable enough to be made, or if they can, will break down in the reaction mixture before a cross-coupling can take place. This is a problem in drug discovery, as these electron-deficient heterocycles are often preferred to their electron-rich analogues, which they are used as isosteres to replace. This is because they are not as easily metabolized by cytochrome enzymes in the body as their electron poor nature makes them harder to oxidize. These boronic acids break down by a process called proto-deboronation, which is the most common side reaction in Suzuki couplings. It occurs in aqueous environments and can be catalyzed by both acids and bases. This is a problem as Suzuki reactions are usually carried out in a biphasic system of an organic solvent and water with the addition of a base. This problem is made worse when the boronic acids are in the two position to a heteroatom like nitrogen as there are additional deboronation mechanisms. This means a lot of heterocyclic boronic acids that medicinal chemists would like to use to design new medicines cannot be used due to their instability. This is where the advantages of the stilly coupling really start to show which were probably not realized at the time of its discovery. This is because, unlike the unstable boronic acids we just mentioned, their organotin derivatives can be prepared and are bench stable, with many of them being commercially available. While many people assume that the Stilly reaction is no longer used in drug discovery, this is simply not the case. Two patents from Merck, one published in 2008 and the other in 2014, showed them using the stilly coupling for exactly the reasons we just discussed. In these patents, the stilly reaction was used to couple a thiazole and a pyrazine, which are both electron deficient heterocycles. There are valid concerns about tin contamination from the stilly coupling, which is a problem because as we discovered, alkyl tin residues are toxic, and that due to these reasons, it would be impossible to use these reagents on any large scale process. However, this has been achieved on several hundred gram scale with Pfizer's GMP synthesis of their VEGFR kinase inhibitor, which they were looking to test in clinical trials in cancers associated with this pathway. The team of chemists had tried several cross-coupling reactions with all giving low or inconsistent yields, except the stilly coupling. They decided to use this reaction going forward, with the toxicologists on the team setting the upper limit for tin contamination at 20 parts per million, which would be measured by inductively coupled plasma emission spectroscopy. A simple aqueous workup and wash with methyl terbutyl ether brought the tin levels from around 170,000 parts per million to 154 parts per million. This material could be used in the next reaction step which after column chromatography, which they performed using a 20 gallon column, gave tin levels of two parts per million, well under the limit set by the toxicologists. Thank you for watching this video. Let me know what your thoughts are on the silly coupling in the comments below. There are also other reactions and conditions that can be used to solve this problem, which I can cover in the future if people are interested. References have been organised and linked in the description and if you would like to help support this channel, giving this video a like is the easiest way you can help.